Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon to, uh, to give this short presentation. Uh, this is the transparency index of, of all countries. Uh, so the, the longer the, the red line, the more transparent you are. So uh, you can see that the US uh, and the UK and Australia are in the highly transparent sector. Uh, the Philippines uh, is in the middle. It's actually between China and Indonesia uh, in the what's called the semi-transparent uh, area. And, uh, well, Vietnam, unfortunately, is still in the, the low transparency uh, area. So that uh, has got a bit of catching up to do. Ease of doing business. Uh, Singapore, followed by Hong Kong and the US, are the three easiest countries to do business in. Philippines is uh, down at 108, uh, which seems low, but that's up. Last year it was uh, 133, so it's actually gone up uh, 25 points. So obviously progress being shown by the Philippines there. Uh, transaction volumes, that's real estate transactions. Um, if you look in the, uh, the Asia-Pacific region, Japan is by far away the, uh, the, the most activity with about $70 billion worth of real estate transacted, followed by China and Australia. But on the right-hand side, we can see, or perhaps you can't because it's a little bit small, but uh, uh, the Americas uh, in uh, 2012 and 2013 combined um, transacted $445 billion. Uh, Europe, Middle East, $356 billion. Asia Pacific, 225 That's a growth of 29%. So obviously, Asia Pacific is the area where there's more real estate transactions taking place than, uh, than anywhere else. Uh, land ownership is always a, a, a key thing and uh, a, a quite a topical thing at times. Uh, foreigners, as you know here, can't own land. They can only own 40% um, or, or own 40% or own of a company that owns land. Um, but so on the left side, you can see that South Korea, the US and the UK uh, all allow foreigners to own land up to 100%. So no restrictions on foreign ownership at all. Um, and then on the right-hand side, uh, we, we have uh, where foreigners can't own land but can acquire long-term leases, as in the Philippines. So China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam all fall in that category where, as a foreigner, you, you can own a long lease. And here it's 50 years with an option to renew for 25 um, the, the what countries in the middle, Australia, India, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, foreigners can own land uh, outright, but there are special procedures, requirements, or government, government consent required. So uh, ownership, but uh, a few restrictions. And, uh, well, in most countries, locals can own land outright, uh, including the Philippines. Um, China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam fall into a category where you, you can't own the land outright. You can just own a long lease. Uh, the stock exchange, obviously a, a key factor in the growth of the economy. If you look at the, uh, the total capitalization, the U.S. is, uh, is far, far ahead of anyone else, um, followed by Japan and China. Uh, but the Philippines, with a, uh, a total market capitalization of $228 billion, uh, with 258 listed companies, is, is doing pretty well. And you can see that it's just a bit below Thailand, but considerably above Vietnam. The number of days needed to start a business. Uh, Australia, Hong Kong, and Singapore break the record. Apparently, it, you can start a business from scratch in two and a half days. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, Philippines, a little longer. We're up at 35 days. Indonesia seems to be the worst at about 48. So obviously, the faster that a, a company can actually get established and uh, incorporate, then the more attractive that location will be. So where is all the money going in these uh, real estate transactions? Uh, 
there are super cities that uh, transacted over 30 billion dollars worth of, uh, of real estate and the super cities are New York, London, Paris, Tokyo and Hong Kong. And 30 cities in the world account for nearly half of the global commercial real estate investment. And the Asia Pacific is now on par with the US as a global market. You can see the the multicolors are Asia Pacific and the dark colors on the left uh, are US and, and the European Union. Um, so up to what, two, 2007, Asia Pacific was less than the US. Uh, but from 2010 onwards, the, uh, the market for Asia Pacific uh, actually exceeds that of the, of the US. That's Asia Pacific combined. And uh, we're predicting that the Philippines real estate market uh, will grow 50% to a $300 billion market by 2031. Two years ago, it was $48 billion, which, uh, which put it somewhere down the bottom of the list, uh, below New Zealand, but again above Vietnam. Um, and uh, as I say, that is expected to grow to 300 billion, which will represent 0.3 of a percent of global transactions in real estate. Now, if we look at the, the Philippines more specifically, uh, some key facts, uh, a very large population, nearly 100 million, uh, median age of 23.4 years, so it's a very young population, which is good. A 41 million labor force, 7.5% um, unemployment rate, a very high literacy rate, 97.5%, um, imports at $62 billion, uh, 2013, exports of 47 billion, uh, a $268 billion economy, with a, a GDP growth last year of 7.2%, which was the second highest uh, in the world. Um, external debt, public debt. Okay, next. We're ranked 75 out of 145 economies to invest in. Uh, the investment grade ratings have gone up from BBB minus to BBB, or they will in May of this year. Uh, we were judged uh, by the Japan External Trade Organization as being the most competitive country among seven Asian economies. Um, we're investor friendly and uh, the Filipino people, uh, as we know, English proficient and culturally adaptable, dependable, dedicated and provide a world class service, which has obviously been influential in the growth of the BPO sector and we have a free market economy here. Uh, that's a, a map of Metro Manila and shows all of the emerging business districts. A few years ago we just had Makati and Ortigas and more recently Fort Bonifacio. So there are three areas in the set, what we call the central business sector but now we have emerging districts in the north, the west and the south I think there are now about 32 uh, emerging CBDs, which basically have come about as, uh, as the central areas have become saturated, um, running out of space, uh, rents have risen, obviously, in those central locations. And uh, in order to tap a wider labor market, uh, companies, when they expand, are now looking at these uh, other sectors to, uh, to grow their business. So about 33 new CBDs emerging uh, in the NCR region. Uh, outside of Metro Manila, you can see in, in Luzon, uh, we have Pampanga, quite a lot happening in Pampanga with the uh, uh, Clark, the growth of Clark and the Clark Green City, uh, in the special economic zone there. Tarlac, Baguio, Bulacan, um, a lot happening in the Visayas, Iloilo, Bacolod, Dumaguete, particularly Cebu. Uh, Cebu is the second largest BPO location after Manila. 
and then uh, Davao and Zamboanga down in Mindanao, which are, uh, are now becoming more prominent. Uh, office supply, that shows the, the pipeline versus current. The, the dark uh, sector is the current supply, which shows uh, seven, just over 7 million square meters uh, of office space spread throughout uh, those various, uh, they, were, they were very reluctant to, to put their, uh, their signature on a, a document when the building wasn't finished. But given the, the demand, the pent-up demand, and the fact that if you leave it too long, you miss out on the space you want, more tenants are now inclined to, uh, to pre-commit. So you can see that that's why that, uh, that particular number has grown significantly. And again, most of the activity there, pre-commitments, 46% in Bonifacio, global city. Uh, the IT BPO industry has been a major, if not the most major, growth driver over the last few years. Uh, we are number two after India in the, uh, the total uh, 100 uh, outsourcing destinations, but we are actually number one for voice, for customer service, the Philippines is number one, uh, with over 700 IT BPO companies now here in the Philippines. Uh, and direct employees in the industry are about 960,000, with revenues last year in excess of $15 billion. Uh, so uh, the growth driver there, BPO sector, you can see a, a compound average growth rate of 19%. Um, the, the three columns at the end show uh, the, the low end projection for uh, 2016, uh, the baseline projection and the roadmap that was uh, set out by the Business Processing Association of the Philippines. And uh, originally, we thought that the, the baseline would be the most uh, um, realistic scenario, but uh, that shows a direct employment of 900,000, which we have now reached last year. So uh, the baseline is very conservative, um, and it looks as though the roadmap projection of 1.3 million employees um, and uh, Revenues of $25 billion will be achievable by 2016. Um, we know that Manila has been the, uh, the major uh, growth area for BPOs, and uh, there's about uh, 700,000 seats here. But I think it's worth looking at the, uh, the areas outside of Manila because uh, they're certainly on the up. Um, Cebu uh, has got a big population, 2.6 million, and is the second most favored location after Manila. Um, Davao, nearly 1.5 million, is becoming very popular. Pacolod and Iloilo in the Visayas, also very popular. And uh, Laguna, Cavite, and Pampanga in, in Luzon province. So uh, there are now nearly 154,000 seats, BPO seats, outside of Metro Manila. Tourism, another one of the, uh, the major growth drivers. Um, if you look at the Asia Pacific and, uh, as a sort of tourism destination, China at the top there is, is far, far ahead. Last, uh, last year, or in 2012, received 57 million tourist arrivals, followed by Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Thailand. Um, Philippines is down in the 13th position with uh, 4.2 million in 2012 and that went up to about 4.7 million last year. So uh, it's growing. It's, uh, th th there were a few um, natural calamities last year that uh, I think had an impact. So they were hoping to, to hit 5 million but it didn't happen. Uh, I think this year it will. They're projected to, to go over 5 million. And by 2016, the Department of Tourism is hoping for up to 10 million tourist arrivals. So there we are, 4.7 million uh, tourists arrived here last year. And by far, the biggest number from Korea, 1.1 million Koreans came, followed by, uh, that's in the wrong order, 426,000 Japanese and 412,000 visitors from the US. 
um, well, that really just shows the, uh, the the tourism, the size of the tourism sector relative to the number of hotel rooms. Uh, a bit difficult to read, but it says that in Metro Manila, there's about 33,000 hotel rooms in total, um, and 50,000 50, in the Visayas. Uh, so 196,000 hotel rooms throughout the country. And we know that in, in Manila itself, there's... Uh, there's about 6,000 rooms, additional rooms planned in the entertainment district, the reclaimed area by the bay. Uh, 6,000 6, new rooms are expected to be added in the next three to four years. Retail is uh, another big growth area. Uh, we have four of our malls here are in the world's top 11. So the biggest two are in China, as you can see, Dongguan and Beijing, um, and then SM City North, uh, Mall of Asia and Mega Mall 3, 4 and 5, all with well over 400,000 square meters of space. Growth prospects. So the major growth drivers that we've, uh, we've touched on, offshoring and outsourcing, uh, the remittances, which continue to grow, they were, I think, up near, near to $25 billion last year and seem to be growing at 8 to 10% per annum. Tourism, it, it, it's on track, but is really dependent on infrastructure growth. And uh, PPPs, public-private partnerships, which uh, are really in place to provide that uh, infrastructure, which will generate uh, the additional tourism. Challenges. Uh, well, corporate ownership of, uh, of companies does have a direct bearing on foreign direct investments. So you can see that those countries on the left that allow 100% uh, foreign corporate ownership uh, ha received an awful lot more foreign direct investment. China, US, Hong Kong, etc. Um, in the Philippines, it was $2.8 billion, which is growing. It's continued to grow, but um, it allow, allows 40 to 60% of foreign corporate ownership. So if the rules could be relaxed in, in that area uh, at some time in the future, uh, our view is that uh, the, the level of foreign direct investment here will certainly go up. Country risks, that's probably pretty difficult to read as well, but from... 2001 up to last year, there's been every year there's been a a setback, if you like, um, riots on Edza, uh, riots in in uh, Mindanao. 2003 there was a SARS outbreak. Uh, 2004 um, various uh, various issues there. Uh, every year, state of emergency declared in 2006. Um, several attempted coups we knew about, and uh, the death of Cory Aquino. So, you know, in a nutshell, a lot of adversity thrown at us there. Uh, the super typhoon last year and the earthquake. But in spite of all that, the, the tourism, uh, tourists are still up at, uh, at last year, 4.7 million, and uh, projected to, to be well, according to that chart, nearly 6.75 million this year. Uh, the BPO industry, the revenues there in the dark red, um, 15 billion last year. And uh, overseas remittances, overseas worker re remittances continue to grow at a, a sterling rate. So, you know, in spite of all those challenges and setbacks, uh, the growth has occurred. So it... Uh, it bodes well for the Philippines. And finally, just a, a quick page on who we are, what we do. We're at the forefront of the BPO industry, servicing the uh, tenants in the BPO industry. Uh, we service eight of the top 10 companies. Um, we've secured 26 new sole agency appointments, and Sheila, who, uh, who takes care of that side of the business, is here today. So that's a 75% share of the uh, agency appointments here, and uh, we service about 60% of all of the office space uh, occupied by the BPO industry. And that's it. Thank you very much.